Welcome to the Women in Public Policy Program Seminar Series Podcast at the Harvard Kennedy School. Talking to the speaker that I lost track of time. <laughs> but um, that was selfish of me because you guys are going to really enjoy uh, interacting with her too. So my name is Hannah Riley Bowles. I'm the research director here at the uh, at WAP, where we are committed to closing gender gaps in uh, health and education, political and economic participation. And um, as part of that, we run this seminar, uh, which uh, tries to, which has an opportunity to connect uh, research to our community, but also to support research that um, helps close uh, these gaps that we that we're targeting. So this. As a reminder, uh, this seminar is being recorded for pro podcast, and we have a very um, wide community of uh, people who now listen to the or who are joining us. So we're think imagine ourselves in the midst of a much larger community, and um, and we'll we'll ask that you you uh, self manage your comments as if there were a very large community. So thinking about really keeping questions um, focused on well, one asking questions rather than um, you know, just sharing your commentary and keeping things focused on the subject of the talk so that um, everyone in the larger community um, stays on tax and gets to maximize their learning from the speaker. Um, we also uh, ask that cell phones be turned off and that, and then as I mentioned, that audience questions be on topic and specific. Um, today we have Jamie Latch, who's an Associate Professor of Management and Organizational Development at the DeMore McKim School of Business at Northeastern. And she is going to be talking about how supportive work environments shape new mothers' self-efficacy and um, ultimately their turnover decisions. And I just want to talk about Jamie for a moment, because I remember you when you were a doctoral student, you used to joke, this is, I'm, they, I was always told you're never going to get a job if you're doing research on mothers at work. And, and then she goes and she gets a job, and then the line is, well, who are you going to get? You're never going to get tenure doing um, research on mothers at work. And here she is now, well tenured and into her career, a leader on not only mothers but also fathers at work and this important um, interplay, and also now doing research on um, really gender diverse partnerships and parenting and work. So we're just going to see this one paper, but she is someone with whom I think all of us are going to have uh, connections. So thank you very thank much. You. It's really and of course, thank you. And of course, now I have to worry about going up for full. <laughs> Still a ways away, but of course I'm already thinking about it and all the changing expectations. Yeah. And I was just having a conversation earlier with one of the students here, and we were talking about how um, there's still a change in it. I still hear. Are you sure your research is publishable in top quality, high quality journals? Yeah. I'm like, well, Look at my CV. I've done some of it. I mean, <laughs> God. So you wonder where this issue of self-efficacy comes from, <laughs> um, which is why um, it's a it's a topic of interest to me. So it, it's funny. I was just came off of a three-day conference at Purdue on women and leadership, um, and so it was kind of a nice session where they blended a lot of academics and practitioners. And I was sitting next to actually one of my colleagues on this paper during one of the sessions, and I opened up my presentation, and she looked at the title. And she's like, that's going to be a short presentation. Clearly, an the answer is no. <laughs> Can professionally, women, professionally employed women have it all? So we sort of chuckled. And then I was just telling Hannah, last night, I was, woke up in the middle of the night and started forming my list. If anybody's seen or read the book, I don't know how she does it. I was forming my list. But my list was a little different last night. My list was, do I have it all? <laughs> So I started to, I think I do. I can give this talk. I, you know, besides my research, am I legitimate? Um, and I, then I started going through my list, and then I started to think about my research and how it applied to me um, specifically. And then I started to think, wow, well, there are things that still hold me back and influence how I feel about myself in the context of, of my job and my kids. And then it started going to my kids, and oh, my kids don't think I'm a good mom, you know? And anyway, so um, I'll weave in some of my thinking that I, if I start remembering it, um, from what I was thinking about it in the, in the, in the middle of the night. Um, so this paper, it's a little misleading to say um, it's about can professionally employed women have it all, because I'm not going to be talking today about the population of all professionally employed women. This is a data set that's specific to first-time mothers. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the history of that project. Hannah probably remembers some of this from, from way back then, when, because it, it goes back a while. Um, and 
where, where the having it all comes into play is really around the framing of this paper because when you become a first time mother, how many mothers do we have in the room here? Okay, so even, even really depending on where you are in the motherhood realm, you're constantly questioning, you know, can I do it all? And when you become a mother for the first time, it's that very beginning point of thinking, especially when you go back to work, oh geez. And then there's all these expectations that are surrounding you. You're, even, if, even if you don't hear any bias in particular, you assume bias from what's going on in the world around you. So we'll talk about some of these things and, and where it comes from. And I couldn't do um, this without you know, a psalm card because these are always uh, <laughs> So funny, I missed the memo that said, we ladies are now expected not only to hold down a job, but also to knit, craft, and bake from scratch, all while having washboard abs. So <laughs> really, what is the definition of having it all? You know, do we really know what that is? I mean, I like washboard abs. <laughs> I'm striving for that in my post-baby, post-tenure career. Um, and then this other one that says, you know, sure, I'd like to have everything, but where would I put it? <laughs> um, you know. For those of you who are moms, I'm the mom of three boys and my car, actually I couldn't even park my car in this lot because it's meant for little cars and I have a big car. I don't want a big car, but I don't have a choice but to have a big car because I have three boys that are playing lots of sports and doing a lot of things and, and I don't have a choice as much as I really just want something small and compact that can navigate around the city. So let me tell you a little bit about this project history because it dates back a long time ago. Um, I actually did my dissertation I didn't even know that you could do dissertations on topics around motherhood or work family. And someone also asked me, how, why are you in a business school? Why are you studying this in the context of a business school? And I actually had to make that case when I was going up for tenure a couple of years ago. Everybody kept saying, make sure in your dossier, you, you put in the, you know, there's something about what bottom line, well, I don't have any direct bottom line results, but this conference I just went to, right, there was a woman from PricewaterhouseCoopers, and she said, we don't have a choice but to help working mothers and to support working mothers. It's a business imperative. We lose $55 million a year um, due to retention uh, or um, people leaving and turnover costs. So it's, it is a business imperative and there are bottom line results. I don't care that much about them, to be honest. <laughs> um, I care more about what's going on in the minds of women and how we can figure out a way to create supportive work environments to, to preserve their sanity. <laughs> Um, so again, this dates back to my dissertation, and I'm actually, I decided to weave in some of my qualitative, my dissertation was qualitative, and it was on mothers returning back to work after their, after their first birth um, and after maternity leave, and it was really trying to understand what that experience looked like and how they started to reconcile their work identity with this new identity of becoming a mother. So um, that dissertation was the segue into a much bigger study that, uh, that is what I'm presenting on today. But I actually like how it gives validity <laughs> just through, you can actually hear the voice of women through the findings, um, so you'll see some of that today. Um, I, when I started at Northeastern after I graduated, I got a, gr a, a grant from the Sloan Foundation to be able to do this, um, this data set, and this is really strange. I partnered, as this is on tape, and I'm gonna say I partnered with ISIS. But it's not that ISIS. <laughs> Believe it or not, um, for those of you who might be from this area, there used to be this wonderful organization called ISIS Parenting. And that was where you went if you wanted all things baby, um, from prenatal yoga to hospital tours. And it was, it was just a, a wonderful community of mothers, both working and non-working mothers, and just whatever you needed in terms of your baby needs, uh, even at a store. They had really great stuff, and I don't even know why. It, it went out of business a few years ago. It was a very sad, sad thing. But I had a partnership with them, and um, I was able to collect data through their organization. Um, and you'll see that in the sample today. Um, so why do I study new mothers? Because I have these three boys, and <laughs> they have sort of come. Oh, this is a recent <coughs> picture from my son's bar mitzvah. But they've sort of come along with me through this journey. And when I started as a PhD student, People used to come, I was known as the one that had a baby. You know, I had just had a baby when I started my PhD. My son, Charlie, was 12 weeks old. And I, um, I don't know, I just got a, kept getting all these calls from people saying, I heard that you had a baby when you're getting your PhD. And I'm interested in a doctoral program, but I don't know if I can make it work, and can I talk to you? And I started talking to all these women. And it's funny, because now I'm seeing them later in their careers, and I forgot that I talked to them, or I might have, and, and so I have, I just, it was interesting that I could have these conversations with women and then I could later study them. So um, 
so they, these three guys have really been the driving force behind a lot of my research. And the twins came along in my fourth year, if you were wondering, of my PhD program, to which I'm going to call out Judy Clare for a second, because Judy Clare was my advisor at BC. And when I told her that I was pregnant with twins, <laughs> the first thing she said to me was, are you going to quit? <laughs> and I was so mad at her that she said that. I'm like, what? You can't say, no, I'm not going to quit. Are you kidding me? And um, maybe most of you will get this one. I love to be able to say this in front of a room full of academics. Our PhD director is um, a network guy, and he does, Steve Borgott, well, he used to be the PhD director. He used to be at BC. He's at Kentucky now, but he's a big network scholar. And I showed him my, um, my ultrasound of my twins when they were obviously... I was just a few weeks pregnant, and I showed it to him, and I said, you know, I, I can't understand this dyadic relationship. Can you please explain it to me <laughs> <laughs> in any terms you might know how? And he looked at me, and this is a guy that when I first got into the program, and we all went around, the t I hadn't told anyone I, was, I, had, I had just had a baby or that I was pregnant when I applied to the program. And when I did tell them when, in our first meeting, I said I had a baby, and it was a week after I had my son. I, his mouth dropped, and I think he really thought, oh no, she is, we made a mistake with this one. Um, but by year four, he looked at that ultrasound picture, and he said, he sort of pointed to my stomach, he's like, you, there? And he's like, eh, like it was no problem for me. And I'm like, wow, I have now set this expectation that I am this like super doctoral student that can handle being a mom and being a doctoral student. I don't know why I, I didn't say anything about twins in this. So. Um, Anyway, that was the driver for me. I obviously didn't quit. I kept going. Um, Judy also told me my hips were going to split, too. <laughs> <laughs> so my advisor was not as, um, she was very supportive in some realms. She has many other strengths. She does. <laughs> she has many, many other strengths. Um, all right. So um, just a little bit about, about this project. Um, and, you know, um, obviously it, there's a long history aside, um, aside from this. And by the way, uh, I was just pulling up the recent BLS statistics on working mothers. Does anybody know how, what percentage of mothers work in this country with children under the age of 18? Yeah, it's pretty high, 70%. Um, so then I wanted to look, well, what about when the ages get smaller? So it drops. Uh, so that's 70% for, for women with kids um, under the age of 18. And by the way, 44% of those women are in managerial and professional roles, which is the population that I'm talking about today. So it does drop with the age of the child um, as they get younger. So under three, it's about 60%, and under one, it's 57%. But that's still pretty high. But it does drop. Um, so that speaks to a little bit about um, you know, what's going on for these women. So what is going on for, for these women? You know, this is a period of time. You're, you're trying to figure out who you are. And, and uh, the, the women that I'm going to talk about, the average age was 35. So these are women that have been in their professions in their careers for quite some time. And the age at first birth for first time mothers, at least in this state, is much higher um, than in other states. So in fact, when I was doing my qualitative study, I found it hard to find anyone that, was had, that had a baby before 30. Um, and this, I think that speaks to you know, what's going on in the world around us. So here you are, you've kind of, your identity is, re is really embedded in your work. And then you throw in motherhood to that. And it's starting to kind of, now you're rethinking things. And now you have all this stuff swirling around you um, and influences of other people that might be, um, might be doing this. But also what's going on in the time when you're returning to work after having a baby is you're just trying to figure out how to be a mom, how to handle this little person <laughs> that is going through all these different experiences that you've never um, experienced. I was just talking to a, one of the academics that was at this conference, and we were sitting down at lunch yesterday. And she was eating a cookie. We were actually laughing because she seemed to be able to identify everyone's cookie. So you'd think, oh, she's a mom. She knows, all, she knows her cookies. And she's like, well, I don't let my son eat cookies. And we're like, OK, you're a first-time mom. First-time mom, don't let their kids eat anything. And then once you become a second-time mom, a third-time mom, anything <laughs> goes. Um, but you're trying, you're going through this process of figuring out, how do I do this? You know, and trying to master not just the tasks associated with caring for this new person, um, and that's your responsibility, but also trying to combine that with your work demands. Um, and this is a time that mothers might be starting to think about, thinking about, is this the right place for me? Is this organization the right place for me now that I have this responsibility? Um, so our study really is drawing on social learning, theories around social learning, which is really where the self-efficacy comes into play, and, and issues around social comparison. We're gonna, I'm going to talk about the influence of other, not just your boss at work, but also 
comparison reverence or role models in your workplace, not just other moms, but just other people in the workplace that may be able to exhibit work-family balance so you can see if that's something that's possible um, for you, and how, that, how these work environments shape new mothers' quitting intentions um, through the effect on both job and maternal self-efficacies. Um, I'm sorry, I just was playing around with the slides earlier today, so excuse these women that are dancing around. These are meant to be other moms. <laughs> but this is the mom in the middle, the new mom, and these are all these influences um, that are shaping her experience as she becomes a mom. Very stereotypical, with because that's not me with the vacuum cleaner and the stuff. That, um, the phone is me calling to take out <laughs> food because I don't have time to make anything. But um, when you think about what influences, and, and what is it influence? It's influencing new mothers, but it's influencing their thoughts, their feelings, um, what it means to be meaning that they ascribe to being a parent um, and, and working at the same time. So it, the relationship with the spouse or the partner in terms of who's doing what um, and caregiving responsibilities, other moms um, that, are probably, that you feel may be judging you because either they work or they don't work or they've made decisions that might be different from your own. I loved this. I trying to find a picture of a grandmother working was not <laughs> um, easy to do. But did did your own mother work? You know, and what what? How did you grow up? What was the surrounding around you? Was it acceptable for parents to um, to work? And society. You know, we have all these gendered expectations about what um, you know mother's role is, what a father's role is. And then, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to be focused on these bottom two things, which is the workplace. You know. Okay, maybe you're a company that's made the list of the best companies to work for, but how's your boss? Does your boss understand that you just had a baby, and is that person, you know, amenable to the things that you need them to be amenable? So these are some factors that um, really shape how women start to think about themselves and shape how good a job they might think they're doing in their roles as mothers and professionals. Um, so how, and this is a little bit about the literature in terms of what the literature has said. Basically, it's just some, let me take one step back here. The literature on how the workplace <coughs> and, and support factors influence turnover, things like turnover intentions and some of these other issues shows a direct influence. And really, my goal was to say, well, why? Why do these things, why does the social support in organizations and other kinds of forms of support in organizations influence these things? Is there something else going on in terms of how it um, what the experience is on the individual. So there's plenty of research on job satisfaction and turnover, and I apologize, this is small, but the gist is, you know, probably no surprise there that um, there are studies that show that job satisfaction does decline when women have children, um, especially right at the beginning. Um, but obviously, you throw in supportive work environments, and that that um, alleviates any of that decline, or at least um, some of that decline in job satisfaction. Um, so support is a major determinant for job turnover, especially for new mothers. Lots of research um, have found that for a number of reasons. When you talk about workplace support, it could be, yeah, you might have policies. That's great. But do you feel comfortable using them? <laughs> and if you do use them, are people going to judge you for using them? So it's not just, it's not policies. It's how people might perceive your use of those policies. And then in terms of work-family conflict and role strain, there's tons of research out there that shows that when women feel supported by their boss or their organization, um, you know, they'll feel less work-family conflict, potentially more enrichment in terms of their work and family. Um, but at the same time, they also might experience role strain if the support of the, support of the organization is not that strong. Um, and then, you know, the worst of the worst <coughs> is the stereotype bias and the effects of stereotype bias. And that's what I was saying before is not necessarily something that's overt bias, but it's the covert bias that often gets in the way of how we um, might think about ourselves and, oh, someone said that. I remember my first day, first week at Northeastern, I left at 5 o'clock or whatever and I was walking by this guy's office and I'm like, oh, I'm so jealous. You are you seem like you're being so productive right now. He's like, oh, you have kids. And I'm like, wait a minute. No, what? I'm, I can go home and be productive with kids. But what do those comments do to someone's self-confidence in their ability to do their work? Not, not a lot of good, that's for sure. Um, so these biases obviously affect, and there's studies that have shown that there's good working mother biases out there. Um, so um, while most of prior research has really focused on <laughs> commitment um, to new uh, employer commitment to new mothers, we're really focused on how these perceptions of mothers in the workplace can um, affect someone's desire to stay, um, and that's why we see. 
self-efficacy as this mechanism that might link this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mean by self-efficacy. I'll give you some examples from the qualitative data, and then I'll talk about the results of the study. Um, so by definition, you know, what is self-efficacy? Really, at the end of the day, it's how good a job I feel like I'm doing. Am I a good mom? Am I a good worker? Um, in the context of being a good mom, or uh, being a good working mom, you know, there's obviously some overlap because then you have to think about expectations around ideal worker norms and things like that that come into play. Um, and so becoming a mother, throwing that into the mix, might involve some process of reassessing, you know, what your self-efficacy is, as a, even in your job, right? Because now you're coming back to work, you're a mother, now I have to, am I, am I going to do a good job um, now that I'm a mother? And these are the kinds of things you hear from, from women all the time. Um, so here's some great examples from, from my qualitative data. I just love these. I, I could tell, talk about them all day long. Um, but when you think about maternal self-efficacy, so you have women that say, one woman that talked to me and said, and this is published in a, my, this is from my dissertation, which was published <coughs> in Human Resource Management. Um, one woman said, you're used to exceeding, and you're like, wait, baby, you don't understand. <laughs> I've read books, I'm very organized, and they're just crying in your face, and you don't know what you're doing. So that, that <laughs> level of confidence, like you may have been, you know, the top, salesperson in your organization, and then you just try to have a baby and there you don't know how to handle that. Um, and another comment, at some point, um, it being work, was the one place where I was competent enough and was the star player and I was thrown into this great equalizer of first time motherhood and I felt like a failure. And you know what it's like? It's like running a marathon, sometimes because you're sleep deprived and everything is new and you're just unsure of your own instincts. Now I'm not going to get into the whole policy debate too because obviously in this country, you know, going back to work when a child is only three months old, you're not sleeping. You don't even know who you are. You're walking around like a zombie <laughs> half the time. Um, and although I hate to tell you, especially for the new mothers, that just continues on for <laughs> many, many years. Um, but, um, but this is what's going on in terms of maternal efficacy, unsure of yourself. You mean get your, yeah, yeah, when well you have to train well, it sounds like you're, you're good at that. <laughs> um, and then from a work perspective, having to get used to not putting in 100%. So when you're, you're in a professional role, you've been in for 10, 15 years, you're giving it your all, you love your job, you know, you're, you're feeling like you're that ideal worker, and then throw, boom, motherhood, come back to work. I don't feel like, you know, I feel like there's going to be an effect, even if there's not, still that feeling <laughs> that there might be an effect. So. Um, so these are the kinds of things that women are experiencing. So um, this is what we looked at, essentially. Um, two things, and I think I mentioned this before. We focused on, in terms of supportive work environment, perceives manager support, right? So what does that mean? Um, obviously, how well you think your manager or boss empathizes with your work family needs and is attuned to your work family needs. Um, and uh, obviously, research shows the more supportive your managers are, um, the less likely you might be um, willing to want to stay in your organization, but it also um, um, could have an impact on maybe higher self-efficacy at work if your boss is supportive and of your career. Because hey, listen, now I can go, my boss is supportive, now I can go to my doctor's appointments, I don't feel guilty that I'm not there for certain events um, and missing out on things. Um, and then the other thing that we looked at was, and I apologize because there's changed, the language has changed a little bit over time as this paper has evolved. We call it the presence of role models. Another way we've referred to it is comparison reverence. I kind of like the term comparison reverence a little bit better, although that term makes it seem like it's only mothers. And we were very strategic about this construct being a construct about, is there anyone at work that I can look to that just seems to balance things really well? So it could be mothers, but it could be dads as well. It could be anyone, really. Um, and so we think that that is going to influence how women might be able to think about their own sense of efficacy. Oh, someone else can do it in my organization. And by the way, that person all, also does the same role or maybe even a higher level role. And they can do it, so I should be able to do it, do it all too. Um, I won't get into these, but basically it's just research that shows that people who have role models tend to have foster, foster better efficacy beliefs um, and in turn will let, be less likely to quit. Um, all right, so here's some more examples that <laughs> give weight to it. Um, so what does this actually look like? What does this feel like for women when people are, they're, they're in the day-to-day -day muck and having these interpersonal exchanges at work now that they've been back? Um, 
and these are actual quotes. So one woman talked to me about how her supervisor said to her, now you're not gonna be like one of those other women, right? Um, you know, who, can't, who leaves because she, you can't give it your best. So these are comments that really shape how people start <coughs> to think about it. Um, these other two comments are from peers and other mothers at work. Sometimes the other mothers at work, frankly, are the worst. Um, but peers saying, oh, you're back. Well, wait, you're back full time? I'm sure if they ask, you know, you can go part time. And so then what? Then it's this expectation, well, wait a minute. Am I, God, I feel like horrible. I'm an awful mom. I could have gone back part time, but I wanted to go back full time, or maybe I had to go back full time, but now people at work have this opinion of me that I'm this horrible person for being here full time. Um, and then my favorite, but not so favorite, are the other mothers that say, oh, it must be so hard for you. You know, when I came back to work after I had a baby, I cried and cried and cried. And, and this woman said to me, I didn't cry. I was thrilled to be back at work. I liked my job. Doesn't mean I don't like my child. Although, you know, it was kind of a nice reprieve to be back at work. But you can imagine what these kind of comments um, can do to an individual. So what we really did was we tried to take um, this experience and really see how much it applies um, to a larger sample. Um, so, you know, what are they thinking? Am I a good mother? Am I a deal worker? Can I really do it all? Um, so. Uh, actually, that's numbers wrong. It should be 695. We ended up um, scaling the sample back a little bit for different reasons. But th this was a sample of from ISIS, um, and where um, it was primarily married women who had been back to work um, or had an infant that was at least two years old. So they they'd been back to work. I think the average was about about nine months where they they had been back to work. Um, the mean age was 35, um, and we actually wanted to make sure they had at least three years of professional work experience, just so they'd had enough time to establish a professional identity. Um, and so the mean age there was, was 3.8. Um, this is a predominantly white sample, and um, we used um, structural equation modeling to test the hypotheses and, and a whole bunch of series of nested models to, to look at um, some, of the some of the findings in different ways, and obviously <coughs> throw in some qualitative findings to support and illustrate I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm primarily a qualitative researcher, and it's very hard to go from being a qualitative researcher to a quantitative researcher and not really be able to see what it says, what the data actually says from someone's perspective. So I, I actually enjoyed kind of weaving this um, into these experiences because I think it gives weight. Um, I apologize, you probably can't see this. These are just this descriptive data. Uh, all, I already talked about the bottom stuff, which is mostly the control variables. But I just wanted to point out that turnover attentions from a scale of 1 to 5 was a 2.5. So it was right in the middle. Um, perceived manager support of work-family balance was actually quite high. It was a 3.9 on a 1 to 5 scale. Um, but the, um, the role models was 2.8. Um, job self-efficacy was 4.2. And maternal self-efficacy was actually pretty high at 4. Point, I'm sorry. Job self-efficacy was 4.0. And um, maternal self-efficacy was 4.2. Now, what does that mean? Honestly, this is why I like qualitative research much better, because if I had asked them on a scale of one to five, how good of a mom do you think you are, they would probably say <coughs> three and then describe themselves as a four, or they might say <laughs> five because they don't want to sound like they're a bad mother and describe themselves as a three, so you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt here. Um, you can see most of the had um, spouse, their spouses that worked. These were highly educated women. Most of them had graduate degrees. Um, and the mother's age, it's 35, it's just on a scale, so it's um, on a scale where it um, uh, was on ranges. So, um, all right, let me just get into, I'm just gonna report on the relationships that we found. Um, and you can <coughs> see here, we obviously found strong support that job self-efficacy medi mediated the relationship between perceived manager support and turnover intentions, and maternal self-efficacy did as well, um, partially mediated. We didn't find that comparison reverence or role models influence job self-efficacy, but I want to just point something out here. It's negative, which was so bizarre. And this is my interpretation of it, and I could be completely off base, but when I think about the people that I look up to as role models in my career that are mothers also, um, there's one woman in particular at Northeastern who's been a role model to me, Kim Edelston. She's got three kids. She is a dynamite, she publishes, I don't even know, she's a machine. Um, and she still has time to support everyone and everyone um, around, every, everything and everyone around her. And I start to think, I think my self-efficacy, at least in terms of my job, goes down. 
when I'm around her because I feel inadequate, inadequate um, when I'm around people that are stars, superstars. So I, it, there were no, it wasn't significant, but it's negative. So it just, it could be that that's going on. I want to, I want to study that a little bit further um, down the road. Um, <laughs> what's interesting about the findings is both perceived support for, um, or perceived manager support and role models influenced maternal self-efficacy. Um, <laughs> and what does that tell me? Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, it, they're not, um, the betas aren't that high, but you know, it tells me that the work place does influence our non-work identities. And there's been a slew of research coming out recently that shows sort of the crossover. crossover. I, I wrote a paper on um, cross-domain identity transitions, which looks at pregnancy in the workplace and the experiences of how, you know, um, this transition is really not just becoming a mother. It's becoming a mother in the context of work. And that tells me that there's more of an influence from the workplace on being a mother <laughs> than there is on my job self-efficacy. Now, I don't know what job self-efficacy was before. Did it go down, whatever. I mean, that's, that's one of the issues with um, cross-sectional data, but I'm more interested in maternal self-efficacy anyway and how work domains can influence it. Um, we also looked at a couple other variations of the model, getting rid of that, um, that relationship, adding, adding a relationship between efficacy to actually see if one, and this is actually something that hasn't been, I should just mention this too because we got a lot of critiques about this when we <coughs> submitted this paper to um, um, when it was under review. That why did we look at why did we look at job self-efficacy and maternal self-efficacy separately? Why not combine them to a work family? Mm -hmm. And there is a measure for that. And I didn't want to do that. I think I tried to do it after the fact, but I didn't want to do that because the self-efficacy literature is very adamant that that you look at them separately. It's a domain-specific construct. And so, and it's it's kind of like when people look at work-family conflict, you're always, or work-family identity, or, or career identity. <laughs> at one end, it's family, at other end, it's career. Well, no, you can have high career identity and high family identity. So I would imagine it's the same thing. But that doesn't mean there isn't ro a relationship between the two. And if you already have high job self-efficacy, it could be that high job self-efficacy is influencing maternal. So one domain of self-efficacy might be influencing another domain of self-efficacy. So we played around with these relationships a little bit, and this is the one that we came out with with the strongest model, where that cross-domain effect um, really comes into play. Um, so here are a few qualitative illustrations, although I don't know that they're necessarily. Can we go back to that for a minute? Yeah. So, so is the story then that the better that you're coping at work, the more potential you feel like you have to be a good mom, mm -hmm. and it's really this feeling about being a good mom rather than this feeling about being a good worker mm -hmm. that's motivating turnover intentions? Yeah, well, it makes it easier. It, okay. I, I can feel better as a mom if I know that everything at work <laughs> sort of is okay. But, I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's <laughs> definitely a direct effect, too, but the indirect effect is telling me that, yeah, if I'm feeling good at work, or and I'm supported at work, and that's why I feel good at work, then that might help me a little bit with how I see myself. Uh, or how good of a job I feel like I'm doing as a mom. Did you want to ask? Did you look the other way? What's that? Have you looked the other yes, way? Yes, and it works the other way, too. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, I knew I was going to get asked that. Yeah. I only put the arrow that way, but actually, yeah. um, so interesting. I'm going to just move ahead here because when you think about what the findings are, this post hoc analysis that we did really shows this spillover, a positive spillover effect, uh, assuming that it's, um, I mean, it was positive, that um, obviously, if you're feeling good as a mom, things are good. But of course, it's so short term. I mean, you really need longitudinal data to look at this because anything could, with maternal self-efficacy, I actually enjoyed researching this construct because it, you go, I was like digging into the nursing literature and looking at, especially with young, anyone who's a new mom, will, this will resonate. It, it's like this, yeah. right? Because what happens? Okay, you have a baby, they're not sleeping through the night. Your, your maternal efficacy is like down the tubes, right? Then they start to learn to sleep. Um, and then they start crawling and they're into everything and you're freaking out because you don't know how to handle all of it and then you're, <laughs> sorry, I'm scaring you. Um, <laughs> and, but it, it's just, ebbs, and then they start walking and they're into this and into that and falling and so it's such a ebb and flow. the um, Vicky Iovine books when you were going through that? What's the last name? Iovine, married to the guy with his beats. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah. yeah. that sort of describes that. Yeah, huh? yeah. so I mean, in, in a perfect world, I'd like to look at them kind of <laughs> simultaneously yeah, as yeah. they sort of uh, um, as things move along and the qualitative stuff 
gets at that, I think, a little bit better than yeah. the quant. That's why I, I that's why I, I don't, I, I'd rather present it with the qualitative stuff. Let's give nice. weight to it. Um, two things. One, I didn't know if you'd looked at the study that was done on a data set that was from Great Britain that looked at women who were mothers working and married had the highest health rating and job satisfaction. And <coughs> that ended last week. Right. And, and oh, that just came out, right? There's something new. It was like two, um, the one I'm talking about was I think like two years ago. Okay. And then the, the one other piece is looking at who self and I know this is beyond the scope. Yeah. If you have any thoughts on it, yeah. I'm really interested. Okay. Who self selects in to the cohort of being sort of um, highly employed and a mother? Like I'm interested in who selects in and who selects out because we study it mm -hmm. kind of within the silo. Right. But I think there's probably some interesting narratives about who chooses not to be on that path. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I haven't looked yeah. at that, but I, I know I think that that's a really interesting piece of the puzzle here. Yeah. And you know, I mean, <laughs> there's, I think the assumption is that women opt out, and it doesn't mean that they're opting out of their career, it just means they're opting for something different right. that is tied to whatever their situation. Right, and, and in terms of women leaving the sort of opt out myth, women are employed within the same sector you know, within, I think, right. the, the furthest was like 2.2 .2 years. Yeah, and actually, I will say, everyone in, to be part of this study, I didn't, I can't believe I didn't mention that, you had to have gone back to the same organization. Now, it doesn't mean that after you had, after your maternity leave, it doesn't mean that you left and went somewhere, you couldn't gone, left and gone somewhere else after that. Um, I will just say, um, some of the women in, in my qualitative study, um, a lot of them didn't opt out. They opted for something different mm -hmm. um, or something better, yeah. and it, they did not. It, you did not see a decline in career aspirations. It was just looking for something else. Um, they just. It was. And I always say, because now I've done all this stuff on fathers. <coughs> there's something about maternity leave, even though it's so short here in this country, um, where it uh, provides women with an opportunity to really recalibrate and think about, you know, who they are and whether this job is something that's actually. There's a great study by. Um, I think her name is Lucy Bailey. Um, it's a little bit older, from 1999, but she talks about that, this excuse, that motherhood is an excuse to get out of a career that they didn't like anyway. And poor dads, to be honest, who don't, unless they get, unless they take a paternity leave, although usually it's much shorter, they don't have that opportunity to really reflect, because think about all this stuff that's swirling around, that, that picture that I showed with all these people, you know, all these, all these groups um, influencing, you know, your thoughts and feelings and what it means to be a parent, and now you have this chance. You have time, actually. Not much time, but you have some time to start looking around. And a lot of women during their maternity leave start looking for other jobs if they think their, their organization is not going to be supportive. And during that time, by the way, a lot of them are asking for flexibility. Some of them are getting it, some of them aren't. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm a professional so woman who's pregnant for the first time. Okay. So the biggest thing I'm thinking about is financials. Um, and so, you know, in my marriage, I'm the breadwinner, not my husband. Mm -hmm. um, and so, not <coughs> going back to work isn't an option. And even thinking, let's just say now, about going to a different job, mm -hmm. still, how much money I would make when I would take a pay cut mm -hmm. is the, you know, one of the, I mean, I don't have a baby, so it wouldn't be a top concern, but now yeah, that has to be a top concern. Mm -hmm. Because you also you have a mortgage payment mm -hmm. that the childcare cost that's based on, you know, what you make now. And right. so, um, I want to know where we are the, talk about financials and particularly when um, you're having things like um, gender pay equity or more women being the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what's the, your question is how do you? Uh, uh, was that discussed at all in your research? I, I definitely in the qualitative, I mean those are the, <laughs> the uh, these are women that, uh, they're men, by and large, the men were the breadwinners because um, for the larger sample. And I would say in the, qual I mean, in the qualitative sample, there may be one or two where the women were the breadwinners. Um, but it's a negotiation. You know, I mean, I think it's a negotiation between, there was one woman actually in my qualitative sample whose husband decided to stay home because it just made more financial sense to them. Because then you throw in, well, does child care, the cost of child care, mm -hmm. and if one spouse just can't, you can't, their income isn't going to be able to cover it then um, and someone just needs to be there for certain things but it was a huge struggle I mean I don't want to scare you but I mean it is for any any um, any working mother to I mean it happens to me I'm actually divorced 
Um, my ex-husband and I are really good friends, but I'm, I'm actually dreading. <laughs> Next week, we're going to a parent-teacher conference, and I hate going to those parent-teacher conferences with him because he always throws out something, and it makes me feel horrible, like, oh, he knows more about their homework than I do. <laughs> you know? Oh, what is he talking like, He's talking about something he did with one of, one of um, our twins, and I didn't do it because it was a night that I didn't have them. <laughs> and, um, so I think there's a little bit of that, but it's, um, you know, I mean, you're just, I think it would be worse if it happened later on. You know, you're at that point where you're having your first child, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a chance to negotiate all that sort of upfront. There's some research that shows that um, in, terms of, in terms of gender roles with spouses, um, if, you, if it changes later on, so if a woman's not working when you have a baby and then she goes back to work 10 years later or five years later or two years later, she's gonna still be doing all the same stuff she was doing before <laughs> because those roles and responsibility, I don't remember what, what the, um, the site was. Um, but so basically you can work that out in advance and sort of learn the ropes. There's no expectation yet, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I don't really have a lot of that in the data, but it's definitely something to, and now you have almost 40% of um, women in um, either making the same or breadwinners um, of the family. So that's got to shift and change um, things a little bit. Yeah. I was thinking of your talk. So is this data mostly just new mothers or did you look at people with two children? So so a lot of the things that you talk about when a new baby comes in, right, I mm -hmm. think it gets even more difficult when you have an older child. Well, the reason, this one is only first time mothers because we really wanted to understand that question of that very first point in time when you start to reflect and think about, you know, how am I going to integrate motherhood and, but yeah, and you know, of course this evolved even as my own personal life was evolving, so I would love to look at, I'm actually writing a book right now um, that's going to get into that and it's going to talk about the different life stages and not only forget second child or third child, um, but then as they grow up. You know, you have a whole host of divorce. You have, um, you know, you have kids with um, mental and um, and learning disabilities, and all these different choices that um, make things. Um, I almost say, you know, my paper in Academy Management Journal on pregnancy in the workplace was about the concept of liminality and how pregnancy is this period where you're neither here nor there. You're not yet quite a mother, um, but you're thinking about being a mother, and you're sort of in this in-between state. And the reality is, I think the entire period of motherhood <laughs> is a liminal state because you're neither here nor that you have all these little mini transitions that kind of happen along the way that um, kind of break down the stability <coughs> if, if there is ever, ever any stability along the way. So, um, but I would love to look at it longitudinally. I just didn't um, for this particular study. So, um, I will just, well, I'll, I don't know if anyone has any other questions, but I just wanted to address some of my questions and maybe you guys could help think about um, some of these things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this whole idea of one domain of self-efficacy influencing another domain. So I think that could be another direction for future research here. Um, this whole idea around how do you actually measure that, I'm not sure that I did it, you know, this was first year right out of um, my PhD program, first, um, first um, survey that I ever done in hindsight. There's so many things I wish I had done differently, um, but this whole argument around separate construct, I still believe it should be a separate construct, but given that I even invented the term cross-domain identity transitions um, in my other paper, how can you not look at them as a combined, because the term working mother is a multiple identity that's so complex, <coughs> um, you know, in so many ways, and so looking at them independently or combined, it may, it may only make sense. Because even when you think about job self-advocacy in the context of these women, it's how good a job am I doing now that I'm a mother, right? Or is it just how good a job I'm doing? And hey, by the way, I'm a mother. So it, it's a, you know, a measurement issue. Um, the idea of integrating qualitative and quantitative research, um, I, this has actually been one of the problems that I've had in getting this paper. I mean, the qualitative study has been published. The quantitative study has suffered a little bit because you know, it's self-reported data, and um, you almost barely can ever publish self-reported um, or cross-sectional data. Um, and so there's issues, obviously, with that. But maybe with the combination of qual I, I like that the qualitative data sort of speaks <laughs> to the quantitative data, and I wish more journals were willing to kind of allow you to embed them in kind of a <laughs> integrated way as opposed to starting with one and then the next, um, even though that's how it happened. But now I understand my qualitative data almost a little bit better because of my quantitative data, so I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that. Um, 
you know, there's been issues around is mediation really enough? You know, looking at self-efficacy. I find the concept about self-efficacy really important in terms of first-time motherhood, especially, or motherhood in general, because it's always called, called into question. Um, even last night when I was sitting there lying there, and that, that's where I got to worrying about next, you know, the, the parent-teacher conferences, and I better be up on all my kids' homework and stuff so I don't get shown up by another parent. Or And then I start to worry about, oh, you know, what if all the writings that my ki kids are doing have nothing to do with me because they see me as I'm always working or I'm doing this or that? And, you know, just all these things kind of at work, you know, what does my boss think of me? Now I'm doing all this research on, um, you know, I, of course I sent him that I was doing this presentation and I'm like, oh, why did I do that? Because he doesn't care that I'm doing this work. It's all about corporate governance now. Oh, shoot, I'm on video. Um, flip that. Um, that was the other thing I worried about in my list, not to say that during the presentation. Um, so anyway, these are just some uh, things sort of swirling around in my head, and I would welcome, if there's time, comments and suggestions on how and where to move forward on this. Yes? One question that I had is, you know, you talked about sort of the boss, the, the boss's supportiveness influencing both efficacy of work and efficacy of being a mother. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm wondering if you looked at non-mothers at all, and what is the influence of sort of the supportiveness of the boss sort of in general on self-efficacy? at work, is it any different because yeah. of the fact they're mothers, or is that sort of... That's a real, I don't have that in my quantitative data, but that would be, that's, I, I, I don't forget just the boss, all their co-workers, right. yes. co yeah. um, because in the qualitative data, it gets at that, you know, yeah. you hear all these different stories about what people think, or, or what, at least it's perceived, what people might think of me here, and, what, and you saw some of those quotes. Oh, you know, with the other mothers, and oh, you're not going to be one of those people, and you know, aren't you, why aren't you crying, why aren't you upset? Um, I did, I have to just tell this one story. I had this one woman that I interviewed who was so afraid that the video, the, that, that she was different from everybody else. <laughs> and she kept saying, well, if there are other people like me, I want my voice to be heard. <laughs> but I just want to tell you, she was a product manager for a big um, uh, high tech company. And she's like, I, I, I love what I do. I would die if I didn't work. But I feel terrible saying that. I'm so, and, and so, so some of it is an identity crisis too, where you're kind of trying to reconcile the fact that you should, you know, societal influences are telling you you should be one way, but yet you don't feel that way. But it doesn't mean that you're a bad mother. I mean, I've spent half the time like coaching these women, although then I was just critiquing myself after. Um, <laughs> but so it's a very, I think it's, um, and, and a lot of that is, revolves around people's perceptions. Um, of who they think um, <coughs> their boss thinks they are or is going to be or what their co-worker So I don't have that in the quantitative, but I probably could pull it from the qualitative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of those qualitative um, numbers that you showed us sounded a lot like microaggressions that people experience, yeah. um, for example, in their work workplace. And I, I know that your um, sample was predominantly white, uh, white women who were highly educated. I was wondering how those types of microaggressions might intersect with other um, I don't have enough of the data to yeah. be able to do that, but I think it would be. In fact, I'm, I'm actually questioning, I'm using the, the concept of inter intersectionality in another paper that I'm working on, and I get so confused because it, it's, a, it's a paper about um, work-family conflict of LGB individuals, and so I, we have so much intersectionality yeah. going on in that paper, and they asked us, it's, it, it, it's being revised for a journal, and they asked us to do paired data because they didn't think that the LGB data was enough. Um, and they wanted us to pair them with people in their organization that were non-LGB. Well, that is really hard because you start interviewing people and everybody's got something. <laughs> you know, we're so different nowadays and everybody's worried about who they are. And, and so I'm so confused now about, we have, we, I mean, intersectionality or intersecting identities is a, is a huge moderator in that. But I don't know if it's that they're a parent, oh, this is LGB parents. Yeah. So it's about, um, it's basically looking at, and it's being presented across the street right now, so uh, I'll give you a snippet since you, you guys are missing out on that one, but it's basically about how the work-family conflict literature has sort of suffered from this heteronormity, normativity around um, being a parent, and so on top of being a parent, you know, you've got stigma, that now stigma-based um, work-family conflict, which is how we sort of frame it. Um, but it, is, it, is the intersectionality between being a parent and also, you know, their, home, their um, homosexuality, or is it around 
race, because um, then we had di differences around religion. I mean, all these differences that start to com there's so much complexity associated with it. So I don't have enough of that in this data, but I do have it in another data set. Of course, it's um, specific to one population, but it's so fascinating because um, it just it, there's a lot of complexity, I guess, associated with all the different different um, intersecting identities. Yes. Yeah. Um, so so that's. What you're just talking about is one of the things I'm really interested in. It's like how this complexity, which arrives when you have working, you know, particularly working mothers, um, the way it impacts organizations, mm -hmm. right? So you know, it's 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 from a, um, it's kind of like the, the the importance of bosses and support, and, you know, all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And some organizations clearly handle this very much better, given much higher priority than yeah. others. Right. Um, so, you know, so that um, the, the kind of interaction, you know, the self efficacy, right, is not just like an independent thing which comes, um, you know, which, you know, it's not just a personal internal piece. Right. And um, is there, so, so really in terms of your work, you know, it's like, is there any way in which this is going out? into the organizations to um, have any sort of, you know, guidelines impact um, ways in which you, I mean, this, you know, last week when we were hearing about meritocracy and whatever, mm -hmm. it was like, you know, well, I can tell you they're trying this and it's not working. Mm -hmm. So the question for organizations are really trying to, you know, work up to, to, to being good um, employers right. for Working mothers? Is there any uh, yeah, I just heard this example from this conference I was at, and I thought it was a really good example, and I don't remember now what the organization was that does this. It might be Deloitte, but I might be, I might be wrong. Um, so I don't know that it starts with the organization. <laughs> I think it might start with the individuals changing the culture of the organization. And in this example, I guess on project teams now, they go right when they start their project teams, they all go around the room and say, what can we do? Uh, or, or what do you need to make your life here better <laughs> or easier before or what, what's challenging you right now and so everybody talks about it and lays all their kind of stuff out on the table and then they try to work out um, a strategy for how to best accommodate everybody's needs and just sort of under so everybody's on the same level playing field it's not just an issue for I think this is where companies get it gets so muddled because I'm a big proponent of gr better policies but we all have so many different needs. I don't know that the policy that one organization puts out there is going to work for me and not work for you. And um, you know, we all say one size fits all fits all policies aren't going to work. But if we don't have conversations even within our work groups, that's why I focused on. I have organizational support measures, but the perceived support, the perceived manager support, was so much stronger in the relationship. And I think it's because you need to have conversations. You need to be able to say. And, and actually, a lot of the women that I talked to. Um, through my qualitative study, didn't want to ask for things. And I said, but if you don't ask, then you don't get. And so I think it's about more, ha I don't know, I don't know, but I, I would like to think that it's something more about having conversations, um, you know, and being forthcoming about what your issues are to get them out on the table. Because now we all know that everybody has work-life struggles. And maybe if, if we have the conversation in a, around a conference room and everybody get lays sort of their <coughs> stuff out on the table and it becomes a level playing, if they feel comfortable doing that. By the way, the intersecting identities, I just thought of something. I, I can remember several conversations in my qualitative study. I had a few East Indian and um, Asian women in that sample, and I was always jealous <laughs> because they, they seemed less, um, they seemed more calm. And culturally, uh, they have family that is very supportive of them, and it's very common for um, I mean, I would die if it was my mother-in-law lived with me for six months. But that's customary in those cultures to have support in the workplace. And a lot of it revolves around, oh my god, I am, I mean, I don't mean to pick on you because you're a first-time mother in the room, but I remember when my kids went to, went to, um, went to daycare or you li leave them with a nanny for the first time and there's a, this trust issue and it's so much more comforting to know that your own family member is there and I found a lot of that. Um, with some of those, um, some of those experiences, because it was just a cultural difference that we don't necessarily have, um, you know, here in this country. Do, or where we do you have the data for family support so that people enter into your model and see the relative weight of uh, support of the organization compared 
versus supportive. Yeah, I don't have a lot. I mean, I ha I don't have that extended family support. I have spousal support, but not a not a lot that measures that. But I do in the qualitative because I have the stories um, of what that support looks like from. Because right now, since you have a story that organizational support, the managerial support is built into the mother self-efficacy, so maybe there is yeah. another way around, kind of the family support right. that fits into the job uh, yeah. organization. Yeah. Right? Yep. So yeah, I've looked at that too, but I think I could look at that, um, that more. It's not necessarily in this data set, but it's always been something that I, actually Judy Claire and I always said we want to study from a zip code perspective and look at like the trends between um, like clusters of women that work and, and don't work. Um, it's a huge, I actually think that's one of the hardest things and, and part of working with ISIS maternity on this and I was also going to the classes because I was doing some kind of observational, although I was also a participant as well with my twins. For me, I only wanted to go to the ones that were on the weekend and at night. Set, you know, because if you go into one of those groups, you know, and this I see this all the time, I almost would advise women don't go to a mommy and me class, you know, from even if you're on maternity leave during like the hours of nine to five, uh, unless you know that those, unless it's for working moms, because it's otherwise you're gonna that self efficacy piece I think really starts to ramp up when you start to surround yourself with people who have already made the decision. Um, but you know, I can't, this is one of the reasons I got into this whole research besides the fact that I was having kids but I would listen when I was getting my PhD I would sit there at Starbucks or Pete's Coffee or wherever I was sitting and I would listen to these conversations of these moms that didn't work and whatever was going on later on in their lives after their kids were older they were bored to tears and you know they didn't ha they didn't they didn't have careers that they could I mean they were very smart educated women but didn't have a, a, their foot in the door somewhere that they could continue that so um, I think in a way they they busy themselves right with um, other things, volunteering at the school and and whatever else to make it. You know, there was this article that was in the Boston Globe magazine several years back about how it was actually about Wellesley moms, I think, and how they have so many Wayland. kids, right? Four four to five kids. It was Wayland. It was Wayland. Well, that was about the Queen Bees. It was the Queen Bees, yeah. right? But even <coughs> before that, it was about the, the, these moms that have all these kids, and they, it's like, and I always say, well, maybe that's their, they, they were these people were you know, working at BCG and some of them got their, um, their, you know, MBAs from Harvard or MIT. I mean, these are very smart. In fact, a lot of the women in my qualitative sample are some of these women. And now what do they do? I mean, what do they, they're managing their family <laughs> using those skills that they had in their prior professions to, um, I mean, that's not what the article was about. It was really about how you like one up each other with all these kids. Uh, I mean, I went from one to three by accident. I didn't plan on having you know, twins a second time around. I lost the negotiation actually and said, okay, I'll try for one more and got two at the t same time. So you have these surprises. But these women, I feel like we're making a concerted effort to grow their families so they'd have something to manage. Um, but, you know, I don't have data on that, but I think it's really, I think this, the, the um, influence of other moms is huge, probably bigger than some of the other especially as your kids get older. Maybe not when they're babies, but as they get o as you, as your kids get older and you're so, you're at these school things and you're at events and um, you know it's it's a, it, it's kind of that contrast between, you know, you have at the workplace, you have your manager and your team that are kind of influencing, right? Mm -hmm. So you have your um, your team performing certain tasks and you performing certain tasks and you're kind of matching yourself up to them and seeing if you are being efficacious or not. Yeah. And then you have on the on the flip side, you have these other moms who are like, you know, volunteering at school and doing all of these great things, spending yeah. time with their kids, taking them for ski lessons, etc. And yeah, and you're like, you know, you're kind of dilly dallying between the two spectrums and I feel like, you know, to your point, it's never a single continuum, right? Yeah. It depends on 
you know, it depends on what's okay, fine. I'm, I'm being appreciated at work. Yes, okay, this it's okay if I cannot do this. Yeah. Oh, I'm not being appreciated at work. Oh crap, I'm also an awful right. mom. Right. Yeah, yeah so I know. Like yeah, you just it, you're right. It's like this balance theme. Right. By the way, it's not just the other mothers who don't work. <coughs> It's also the other mothers in the workplace too, because some of the stories I heard from the other mothers, I'm like, well, what are we doing to ourselves? You know, there should be greater support systems in place for, for mothers. So I'm coming always with a comparative perspective. I'm from Germany originally, and then all sort of the policy that Richard Law comes in Canadian countries as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious because you were sort of very dismissive of policies, and I'm really shell shocked to be honest, because I think that um, as an organizational person and pers having a perspective, I think the organizations can set so much of a framework for people to negotiate around, whether it's work hours, whether it's flexibility, <coughs> can I take my work at home, you know, to be able to, to, to sort of work long distance. I mean, the, the whole question about flexibility is something that I believe has a huge impact on well, self I, I didn't, I, I agree. And so I didn't mean to be. when I'm thinking yeah. about childcare. Well, know? and I didn't mean to is be dismissive about it. That, isn't it yeah. I didn't what mean. What do you do with, with I mean, th there's so many policies from companies that can, or universities that can help with sort of emergency childcare, or, you know, mm -hmm. where do you yeah. go when your kid is ill? You know, who is going to help you cover the, the yeah. childcare costs for right. that? Or, you know, so, so I'm, I was just struck by the fact that you were thinking that, you know, these issues that you're discussing, which I think are really crucial, you mm -hmm. know, but that they can't be helped with a particular organizational environment. Yeah, and I didn't mean to be dismissive because I'm not saying that they're not important. There was actually, I'm working on this other paper, right? I've been working on it for a long time, but it, it's actually about that issue, is what's more important. There was a group of economists that wrote this paper a while back that basically said policies don't matter, it's about good managers. And I do buy that a little bit, but it, I didn't like their definition of good management because it wasn't from good managers creating a culture of inclusion and, and so forth. It was about good management, like operation management, like good controls and things like that in place. But um, you, can't ha you can have great policies. And I think in a, in a society where they're accepted by everybody around you, that's great. And born into a society where they're ac accepted around you. But when you start to create policies that are not generally accepted, then it doesn't matter whether you have them or not. I mean, you might go to work at that organization because they have the great policies, but I can't tell you how many women that I interviewed that said, oh, I work for such and such, and we're always a great company, best place to work um, company, and then you start to talk to them, and actually, one organization, I won't say who, but it was, um, I was giving a talk for, to Northeastern alums in New York City a few years ago, and they said, oh, who's the best practice around this stuff? And I said, what do you mean, it's you guys. And they all went around the room and said, no, it's not, and this and that. So, yeah, um, and I was like shell-shocked because that was the example that I always used all the time. And so I'm not dismissing, but we did just have this conversation a couple of days ago at this conference, and there was a woman from Spain that said that she actually feels helpless because she can't do anything about uh, even um, revising policies because they're there and they're sort of, it, it's much harder to change the policies because they're so ingrained into the sort of societal um, or you know the sort of the makeup of go the government and how it's um, how it's created um, but I will say I was talking to a colleague of mine who's at a state school and we were talking about tenure and some issues that uh, that happen at some universities I won't say who but some universities that just start to change their tenure expectations along the way and you don't really know I mean you know they're shifting but you don't know the extent to which they're shifting so they might say oh you got to publish in these journals oh but wait you well good publish in these journals but you know there's only really like a few consensus top tier journals so you really should have been publishing in those so we're not going to give you tenure as a result but my friend was telling me well you know I'm at a state school and we're unionized and I actually feel like I'm protected because I know exact in in our union agreement it actually says what journals we should be publishing in. And so on that hand, I think, oh my God, that's great, you know? But that's not gonna help her with her, I mean, it, it might. It, it's gonna help because there's benefits that she knows are in place that she can take them and she'll be protected um, for, from her job. Now, does it make her feel better about being a mom? You know, I don't know. But I think if you don't have the pol all the policies in the world, and again, this is a very cultural thing I think that happens here in this country all, all the time, is great, give access to all these policies, then it becomes, I mean, it happened at Northeastern. I was on a committee to improve work-life balance. Oh no, I'm on video again. 
but uh, this is true, um, to improve work-life balance for faculty. And so we put this whole policy in place, and I made a big stink. I'm like, this can't just be for mothers. This is for everybody. You know, there's people that are caring <coughs> for sick or elderly parents. Everybody has work-life needs. It can't just be for new mothers. It's got to be for, you know, I'm a mother of older kids. I might need this, that. So it went into practice. They presented it to the faculty senate. Everybody loved it. Our dean sent it out once the policy was in place. I only got from our, biz our school. Um, and it said, new policy for working mothers. And I'm like, what? So I emailed the woman that I'm like, what happened? And it doesn't matter because now, here it was, just assumed that it was only for one population of women and totally undermined the whole value of a program. I think that stuff happens all the time because it, it's not universal or it's not perceived as universal. No, but that's exactly my point. I mean, if we don't have state policies that actually force employers yeah. to have at least a minimum standard, what really happens then, this is happening in this country. Mm -hmm. that you have middle class and educated women who have the best access to work family policies. Yeah. You know, I mean you might be you might be critical of those, but you know, when it comes to the coverage, it's only educated women who have access to actually yeah. to any work life family yeah. family yeah. policies. And so when you think about sort of what it means, you know, for, for middle class, um, well educated women you, you're right. I mean, you, you have all specific situations, and you can sort of negotiate with your individual yeah, employer. You're but right. You're right. That's really a whole different story than having actually, you know, a basic thing. You know, when you are, you know, when you have them work family issues, and I agree with you. I, I think it's really important to think about them really broadly. But yeah. that everybody, anybody, you know, fathers, mothers, everybody, yeah, know. you know, grandparents yeah. has access to. You know those kind of policies right. when they need to take care of other people you right. know, yeah. or of themselves i mean yeah. but i think it's really important to sort of put that into the context yeah. of organizations because organizations are not just you know in in a vacuum i mean yeah. they, they they do have I to know. respond to workplace regulations and it's really appalling that <laughs> this country we are, well i mean we're, know, we're we're just a mess we're still, we, we're still leaving yeah. it up to organizations um and employers and managers to decide whether someone should be able to care for you know, of, of people or not. You right. know, or yeah. So that you had another point. There was more of a comment of. <laughs> I know. Well, it's yeah. a very complex it's thing. I mean, also you think about our education system, right? Yeah. And how our kids. I'm already panicked about next year, so, and my kids are going to go. My twins, the year after next, they're going to go to middle school, and I'm like, oh no, there's no after school in that program, and they end at 2:30. And what am I going to do with my teaching schedule? Now I'm going to have to get a nanny again. It's like you can't win. <laughs> um, just that what we see from the research pretty consistently is if it's a policy, which you intimated, but I'll just sort of say out loud, yeah. um, if it's a policy that is designed for mothers, it usually um, very consistently knocks people off career track and there's yeah. career penalty, whereas if it's a system which is used by um, lots of different individuals in different situations, um, one, men tend to use the flexibility more Right. And two, it doesn't have the same knocking off track effect because it doesn't then tie that person into the motherhood penalty, mm -hmm. which women experience in the workplace. Right. Well, actually, what's interesting about the men from my men's research is that the men, we call it, they do, they do everything in a stealth fashion. They need to yeah. leave work early, they just go. What do we do? We sit down with the bosses and try to negotiate this whole like flexible work schedule, part-time, I'll work 80%, and they just do it. Yeah. And nobody says anything. It's like, oh, he's such a good dad. He's leaving work to go coach his, <coughs> you know, his so daughters. Iron, iron yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so right, yeah. and then they end up right. So, other questions? Well, thank you so much, Jamie Ladge, for this incredibly <coughs> interesting and innovative <laughs> work. For the Women in Public Policy Program seminar next Thursday, we have Lisa Berkman, who's the Thomas D. Cabot Professor of Public Policy and Epidemiology and Director of the Harvard Center for Population and Development Studies at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, and she's going to speak on the long run effect of maternity leave benefits on mental health, and it's evidence from European countries. So, thank you all so much. And do you have a couple minutes if anyone wants to come? Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to eat, so. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone.